On behalf of Texas A&M International University and the A.R. Sanchez Jr. School of Business, we want to welcome you this afternoon to our keynote luncheon speaker. Uh, Dr. Mitchell will come up in just a couple of minutes. He will give his welcoming remarks, and then I will introduce the sponsor for today's luncheon and recognize them for their contributions to the business community, their contributions to the university and the School of Business. So, Dr. Mitchell? My job is to welcome you to Texas A&M International University, and I'm glad to do that. Uh, we've been a four-year institution here at this site since 1995. That's 27 years ago. And this is the 26th year for this conference. So this is the longest-running conference that we host here. It's, it's one of the few that we host here. So uh, it's a pleasure to see it uh, back on track, face-to-face. Uh, at least for today. Um, for those of you who don't know much about the university, uh, in the fall we have about 8,500 students. We're the most Hispanic serving institution in the entire country by percentage of our population, our student population, 93%. Um, so our student body is not very diverse. It does reflect this region in the border area. Our faculty, however, is incredibly diverse. We have over 350 full-time faculty, and they come from about 25 different native countries. It varies from year to year. And we have multiple representatives from some countries. We have faculty from South America. We have faculty from Asia, far in the Middle East, as well as uh, Far East Asia, from Europe, from all over, from every continent. Um, so thank you for being here and uh, have a successful conference. Thank you. As Dr. Mitchell indicated, uh, this is a long-standing conference. This is our 26th annual conference. Uh, on two occasions, we did not hold it, but we continue to count it as if we did. Many years ago, we, we tried to rearrange the venue for this conference to Cuba, of all places. Uh, after a while, we began to see that that wasn't going to work, and by the time we realized that, we didn't have a conference that year. And then two years ago, COVID impacted a lot of things in our lives, and one of the things it impacted was this particular conference. And so we, we canceled the conference two years ago. And the conference last time, last year was purely virtual. This, this conference is a mixture. We're trying to work our way back to a uh, face-to-face traditional conference for us. And so if you've looked at your program, you can see that one of the days of our sessions and presentations is face-to-face -face and the other one's virtual. But the success of a conference like this depends heavily upon our partners, our sponsors, uh, members that are pillars of the business community. And we have several of those sponsors here this morning, and I'll recognize all of them tonight as a dinner. And as a participant, you're invited to the dinner. Look at your, look at your, uh, your, your program, and it will be tonight on the the uh, basically the north side of the Killam building. But before I recognize our sponsor today, I'd like to recognize Dr. Reynas, who's president of the university. We're pleased to have him here today. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell, who serves as the provost and vice president for academic affairs. Thank you for coming. We have many faculty here in, the, uh, here in the luncheon. We have many staff. And we have former doctoral students and presenters on the program who have been invited back and are with us here today. But before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to introduce uh, President Gilbert Navaz and his senior staff 
who are from Falcon Bank, who serve as one of our sponsors. If your table, please, would rise, Mr. Navaz. Falcon Bank is one of our newest members to the advisory board for the Sanchez School of Business. Falcon Bank is, is a financial institution that provides financial services and has been a longtime supporter, a significant reporter of not only uh, the university, but also the college. Uh, through its lending activities, Falcon Bank has been a choice for many of the clients that we cancel and uh, counsel in our small business development center for lending down the road as they begin to develop their businesses. Falcon, among a few others, was very instrumental when we went through some budgetary cuts in our small business development center and provided additional resources uh, to sustain us during a period of, of financial issues. And I want to publicly thank them and recognize them for their support of the college. In a much broader way, in a more significant way, I think, uh, Falcon Bank uh, greatly supports the furthering of education of professional staff at their bank by, by supporting them as they begin to pursue and extend their education. Uh, while many companies do this, Falcon does it in a very recognizable and important way. And so Falcon Bank not only supports the institution and the college and our centers, but also promotes the importance of higher education and higher degrees to its staff. And for that, Falcon should be commended for these efforts. Thank you very much, Falcon Bank. We appreciate that. It is my pleasure today to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the day, Dr. James Koch. James has a remarkable career. Uh, he contributes not only to the academic world through his positions on universities, through his expertise and things like that. He also contributes through his publishing and through his attacking or presenting controversial and important topics. Dr. Koch has done many things in his career. He has served pre as president to two universities, Montana University, and also he's president emeritus, emeritus now uh, at Old Dominion, where he is also a professor emeritus. He has been on the faculty of several prestigious universities, including Illinois State, including Brown University, which is an Ivy League school, uh, and also the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia. Uh, when we dined last night, he, I asked him about this position. He said, well, I basically wanted to take a sabbatical from the U.S. And so my wife and I moved to Australia, and he talked about how different things were in Australia than they were here in the U.S. Dr. Koch has numerous accomplishments as an academician. He's published 12 books and 110 articles in qualified, highly qualified referee journals. His specific area of expertise is in applied microeconomics. Uh, for, the, for the faculty in the college, that was the genesis of the finance discipline. Finance discipline grew out of the works of um, Merton and Medigliani, who are familiar names to finance people. Finance is applied microeconomics, looking at issues dealing with capital structure, theory of the firm, and so forth. But in addition to his academic work, doing the things that uh, faculty are expected to do, publish in high quality journals, uh, he has served as an expert witness and consultant to over 100 corporations and universities providing his expertise on issues that they may confront. Specifically, he's worked at the request of Board of Trustees and Board of Regents, along with other members of a team, to identify and provide recommendations about strategic plans that universities are trying to employ, to provide advice about how they can do things better and perhaps simpler. Uh, today, he's going to talk about a, a subject that I think will get a lot of questions, uh, his more recent research, he has published two books on the plight of the American student. One book is entitled, The Impoverishment of the American College Student, 
And the focus of his speech today is going to be runaway college costs. I did advise him last night, though, that we must hear something good today. <laughs> we don't want everything to be negative. But it is my pleasure to introduce to you, and let's give a warm welcome to Dr. James Koch to Laredo. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And I must tell you that I'm really pleased to be back in Laredo. The last time I was here was perhaps 25 years ago, and that was in the days when you could walk across the border. Uh, things have changed, and uh, I now have a really great teaching example of the value of free trade, how the trade agreement between the U.S. and Mexico has made such a huge difference here and really throughout the country. But what I'm going to do today, I'm used to wandering around in front of classes, so I'll do a little bit of that here. Uh, Pogo and I are going to challenge you to think about higher education in perhaps a different way than you usually do. Maybe not so different here at uh, Texas AMN International, but uh, it uh, is certainly challenging to the traditional way that people look at higher education. Now, you are probably familiar with the simile of the ladder of success, an engine of opportunity. There are lots of metaphors that are used to talk about higher education as a means to go upward in society, as a source of opportunity. But what I have to say today is, Maybe that's not quite so true as it used to be. You look at these names, and these are all people who went to public institutions, for the most part, and did very well. I mean, look at the University of California, Berkeley, which historically has been a low tuition institution. That's a really impressive list. Look at the City College of New York, and I could go on that list. I mean, there are lots more people there. Or look at the HBCUs. These are all people who came to an institution and the institution did good things for them and gave them upward mobility and opportunity. The problem is that's declining. The problem is that, and I skipped over one here, if we look at the income levels of students today, and I've picked out a range of institutions here, and I'm going to show you some other uh, data sets as well, we tend now to be segregating students on the basis of income levels. Here we're looking at the national income percentile of students attending various institutions. But look at this list. This shows you something a little bit different. And this is the percentage of students coming from the lowest 20%. And you can see, for example, that uh, if we're talking about Baylor, 4% of the students there come from the lowest 20% of the income distribution. We're here on this campus, it's 31.9%. One of the things that tells you is that there are lots of students coming to this campus who are looking for that upward mobility. At Baylor, they already have it. Their parents are wealthy. If we take a somewhat different selection of institutions, the institutions on the left here are mostly HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. The institutions on the right, well, they're fairly well-known private institutions. And for example, at Washington and Lee, which is in my home state of Virginia, 88% of the students, or excuse me, the average student comes from a household that's in the 88th percentile nationally in terms of income. So we're not talking about a lower income student body there, are we? Let's look at this again in a slightly different way. These are all, for the most part, uh, institutions that uh, aren't recruiting very many students from the lowest income quintile, from that lowest 20%. And most of the institutions on the left actually come from Virginia. There are many public institutions in the Commonwealth of Virginia that simply do not let in, do not admit very many lower income students. They talk the story, but when you look at the numbers, they're not actually doing it. 
And if you look at their narratives, if you look at the stories they tell, they'll show pictures of these lower income students. They'll highlight them in publications, but the truth is they're not really admitting many, so they can't have, therefore, a very large effect on mobility. Now, this has historically been the way that people sort of look at higher education. We all sort of look at those US News and World Report rankings. Uh, they are very influential. Uh, they're not necessarily written in stone. Uh, there are some problems with the data and all kinds of other things I could mention, but people pay a lot of attention to them. The most recent rankings have UCLA as the number one public institution. Now UCLA this last year received 110,000 applications. They admitted 14% of them and about half of them eventually attended. But UCLA trumpeted this because they've been on the top for a couple of years in a row as an indicator of quality and an indicator of, gee, we're really doing good things for the state of California. And even institutions that are not quite so prominent, and I'm listing three, three here, I could have listed 103 pretty easily, if they move from, let's say, number 97 to number 94, they send out a press release. Wow, isn't this wonderful? When it's statistically meaningless almost, but it also ignores the kinds of things that I'm just talking about in terms of, are we really giving people opportunities? Are we really admitting students who seek to move upward? Now, one of the things that you need to know about US News and Royal Report is they don't really care about some of the things I've just talked about. They give a 5% weight to social mobility. They give a zero weight to whether or not you're enrolling African-Americans or Hispanics, for example. They give a zero weight to income levels. Basically, what they're looking at is how much money an institution is spending. That's the major thing that leaps out because they are looking at uh, faculty salaries and things. That, I mean, none of these things are irrelevant. I'm not arguing that. I'm simply arguing that this particular way of measuring the quality of a university is fairly narrow. Now, what if we looked at things differently? And I skipped over one here. Let's uh, uh, look at this. What if we looked at economic mobility? I think you recognize number three there, don't you? This is out of 1,500 institutions nationally. This particular ranking is a combination of two factors. One is how many Pell Grant students an institution is admitting. In order to receive a Pell Grant, which is a need-based grant, you have to come from a household with a lower income. If you're the only child in the family in the household, probably your income has to be maybe 35,000 or below. And if there are several children in the household, maybe it'll max out at 60 or 65,000, and then you'll end up getting, getting a grant that is not gonna be greater than, let's say, $7,000. But Pell Grants then are a good indicator of how many students a university is admitting who have financial need, for whom economic mobility is very important. Now the other thing that goes into this ranking is how quickly a student can pay off the cost of their education. What's the net cost of attending after grants and scholarships? How quickly does a student pay that off? So this particular ranking is a combination of those two things. And again, Texas a and International does very, very well there. Now, you'll recognize down below here, there's some other institutions that have very good reputations in Texas, but this particular ranking system, and there are others like this, keynotes the fact that they're really not admitting very many of these students and not therefore as actively involved in producing social mobility upward. Now, I don't mean to tell you that there still aren't mobility prospects there because there are American higher education, including, of course, right here on this campus. But what I do want to say is there's nothing out there now like the GI Bill in World War II. 
which made a huge difference for the veterans coming back out of World War II. They could go to school and it was mostly paid for and helped them do everything up to and including buying houses and automobiles and so forth. And it was a significant economic plus for the American economy. Well, there's nothing out there like that now. Maybe there should be. So as a result of the data I presented, and there are lots more of these kinds of things, many people have come to the conclusion that higher education now, sort of pogo-like, is the source of a problem. That some of the inequality in American society today is due to the way we are operating American higher education. That higher education no longer can be counted on to produce lots of social upward mobility. Rather, it's actually reinforcing inequality. I could go back again and show you those income percentiles, and we could talk about Washington and Lee again as that supreme example, but they're really not producing much upward social mobility at all. Now, why is this happening? Well, let's look at what's been happening to college tuition and fees. Now, this is inflation-adjusted tuition and fees. So we have taken out the consumer price index growth. And so this is what's after that. This is what's left over. So if you look at that top sort of orangish line, those are public four-year institutions. And that's 158% higher than the CPI. 158%. Huge growth. And that line in between, that's the private nonprofit four years, and the lowest line is the public two years. Even the community colleges have been increasing their prices much more rapidly than the CPI. Let's look at this a slightly different way and put some numbers up there. If we go back to 2006, 2007, and then look at 2020, 2021, that's the growth of the net cost of attending a college or university. And by net, again, I mean, let's deduct grants and uh, scholarships that don't have to be repaid, but it does not do that for loans because you have to repay loans. Well, this is what's happened, and that makes it look a little bit more modest, but the point is that the cost of attending a college or university has gone up more rapidly than the CPI, even after we take grants and scholarships into consideration. At the same time, the value of the Pell Grant has declined. It peaked out about 10 years ago. The real inflation-adjusted value of a Pell Grant now has gone down. Uh, I am encouraged by some of the talk in Washington now about increasing the size of the Pell Grant because that really is connected to mobility. It really does influence who can attend or go to college. It makes a significant difference in terms of college attendance rates. Now, that orange line is what's been happening to student debt. And that 1.58 is trillions, trillions of dollars. It just keeps going up. In fact, it's above 1.6 right now with the latest data. And what I want you to do is compare that to the blue line. The blue line is credit card debt. Notice that student debt's going up like this, but credit card debt has been sort of constant over time in real terms. So students are regarding, and parents are regarding student debt differently than they do most other debt, which is an interesting phenomenon because if you know bankruptcy law, you know that student debt ordinarily is not dischargeable in a bankruptcy. What that means is that if I declare bankruptcy and I'm a student debtor, the feds are gonna follow me the rest of my life until I pay it off or I make good on it. They might garnish my wages, they can do all kinds of things. And so it is not smart for a student to declare bankruptcy if they have student debt. They might avoid other kinds of debts, but not this. And this makes a difference in terms of economic behavior. The top numbers there show you what, what's the size of this. 
But look at these bottom things. These are all really good economic studies done by economists at the various Fed places and the like. And uh, if you have student debt when you graduate in any significant amount, you're not going to buy a house as quickly. You're not going to buy a car. And this will panic all of you. You're going to live at home with mom and dad. <laughs> That'll panic not just parents, but also students. Something like 35 to 40 percent of students now who graduated this last fall are now living at home. And one of the reasons that's so, uh, you know, there are a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons that's so is they have debt that they can't handle. Now, there are reasons for this, lots of them. One of them is that the federal student loan process is way too complex. You have to submit something called the FAFSA, the free application for federal student assistance. Lots of students don't even submit this because it's pretty complicated and you have to come through with lots of data that they may not have. Uh, it deters people from applying for financial aid. Now, it's a federal form and that relates to the federal student loan process, but to get student aid from an individual college or university ordinarily you have to fill out as well. So. If you don't fill that out, you're simply not going to get financial aid. Now, one of the things I would like to see, and other, many other economists would like to see, is that we would tie loan repayment more closely to people's incomes. If you earn a lot of income, you pay more back than if you learn, or earn a lower income, and for, for perhaps you're in a public service. That bottom dot, though, is also important, and that is that there are some institutions, the evidence indicates, that are loading students up with debt. This is especially true of the private for-profits. Now, the Obama administration attacked this frontally and came through with some new regulations that actually drove some of these private for-profit institutions out of business. There was collateral damage, though, because it also inflicted some damage on HBCUs because uh, a range of black households couldn't get student loans because of the new rules. But some of the institutions, and I can speak from ones that I know more closely in Virginia, are these for-profit institutions load students up with debt, and then they sort of don't care whether they graduate or do anything because they've collected the tuition revenue. And then the next year they bring in a new group like that and it is the federal student loan process that's keeping them alive. What if, and this is another what if, what if we made institutions a little bit responsible for the loans they give out? So that if you give out a lot of loans and people don't repay those, maybe you have to come up with one or two or three percent of that total. That might discipline some of these institutions to think about, well, are we going to load this student up with debt? Because that might affect our own bottom line. Uh, I think that would probably provide a better incentive structure than we see now. Now, there are lots of reasons why College costs have gone up so rapidly. I'm listing 10 things here, and uh, frankly, you should just, I'm shameless here, go out and buy my book, <laughs> books, because all of this stuff is discussed in detail there, and I don't have time, and you don't have the uh, patience to go through all of these, but if you went to a group of state college presidents, they would immediately go to number one and say, it's the state. And there's some truth to that, it's just not the complete truth. Declining state appropriations nationally are responsible for roughly 50% of the tuition and fee increases we see. Not all, but about 50%. But number two is also important. If you're like UCLA and you get 110,000 applications, you can pretty well increase prices however you see fit, can't you? You have a lot of price making and brand power. I'm going to talk just briefly about number four. William Baumel, famous economist, now deceased, published a book, was now about 40 or 50 years ago, 
in which he talked about the economics of the fine arts and performing arts. And one of the things that Baumol pointed out was it was very difficult to increase productivity in the fine and performing arts. And he had this example of a string quartet. A string quartet performing. And he said, if we want to make the string quartet more productive, would we speed them up? No. That ruins the music. Would we eliminate one of the violinists? Well, maybe not, because that would change the nature of the music being performed. And what he said is, well, it's really difficult then to increase the productivity of that string quartet. Then college people seized on this and said, that's the way it is in colleges and universities. You have the faculty member standing in front of the group of students, and he or she is teaching them, and it's been that way for 100 or 200 years, and it's difficult to change that. And besides, there are areas like, let's say, nursing and the like, where you need limited size classes, and you have to be doing lots of uh, activities that require individual attention. So colleges and universities have seized on this and sort of used the string quartet simile to say, ah, the reason we're not increasing productivity the way those guys are in, let's say, computers and peripherals and places like that, where prices have actually been going down, is that it's not really possible. And so colleges and universities have sort of put themselves in the same position as, let's say, a hairdresser. You go to the hairdresser or the barber, you don't really want them to speed up a whole lot. You don't really want them to try to increase productivity at the, at the cost of your head, do you? So this has been an important argument made by colleges and universities. Now, the problem with this argument is it's only partially true. I, for example, at Old Dominion this very semester, I'm teaching 125 students. And I have a few students in front of me. And I have students at ships at sea because Norfolk's the biggest Navy base in the world. I have students around the world. I've got students, I even have one in Texas, who are taking managerial economics from me and they are Zooming with me and we do all of these things and I send out problems and the like and uh, yada, yada, yada. But the point is, I am more productive than the faculty member who is teaching that class of 30, okay? Further, if you look at the data from the American Association of University Professors, it's very clear that the institution of tenure is declining in importance. Not as many tenured faculty members anymore, more temporaries, more adjuncts, more part-timers. Uh, that's another way universities are getting at uh, the cost function. I don't want to beat this stuff into the ground, but suffice it to say that this is not a fixed coefficients production function, to use the language of an economist, which is to say there's more than one way to skin this cat, and universities and colleges, uh, some of them are, are doing that now, so it's not a hopeless kind of thing. And I want to tell you that when I do my managerial economics course, which I've done now for well, almost 20 years, being an economist, I collect data on student performance. And at the end of the semester, after I've given out grades, I acquire their SAT scores and their age and whether they're a military veteran and all those kinds of things and run a regression to see what makes the most difference. And I'll have to tell you that it doesn't really make any difference whether the students are taking the course remotely or in front of me. But their age does. The younger they are, the worse they do if they're, in, if they're Zooming. If they're a military veteran, that's a real positive. Women do a little bit better than men. Uh, I could go on to say, uh, but it is not the case that students don't achieve as well. Now, it may be true that they don't like it as well if they're Zooming, but that's another matter because there are other things that happen on college and university campuses. I want to quickly mention number five. At James Madison University in Virginia, the student fee for intercollegiate athletics is $2,400 a year. 
divide that by 30 semester hours, that's about $80 a credit hour that students there are paying for JMU to be competitive. And they are competitive. They have good athletic teams. My own institution, Old Dominion, which went from no football to Division 1A football about 10 years ago when I was no longer president, <laughs> uh, the student fee is $1,800 a year. Now, somebody's got to pay for these kinds of things, and it ends up ordinarily being students, and institutions end up having to subsidize those. Let me go on, though. Well, there, there are the books. Uh, race out and buy them, of course. Um, let's look at this issue of the state's contribution. If you look at 1990, states were coming through with about 79 or 80 percent of the freight. And now, in 2020, it's only 56. So there's no question but that states have backed away from their support for higher education. That's just not, of course, the only reason these things are occurring. This compares Texas to a lot of other states. And uh, if you look at Texas here, that blue on Texas is the state's contribution. And those are in billions of dollars. and the Beige is student contributions to overall educational costs. And you can see that Texas is still contributing more from taxpayers than students are. But go to the far right. Look at Alabama. Well, in Alabama, it's very much reverse, isn't it? Students are paying the freight there. The state isn't paying very much at all. Like, let's go to the University of Alabama. The University of Alabama, 66% of their undergraduate population is out of state. They have more than 35 out of state recruiters. They've developed a financial model then where students, especially out of state students, are paying the freight. Now, that's not all unattractive to a legislator because you say, well, gee, if you're going to recruit those people, we don't have to come up with as much money. And that's one of the things that uh, is, uh, you're, you're seeing there. Now, what about administrative bloat? Well, that's a factor. But I think this graph will convince you, perhaps, that it's not a huge factor. That top line is the percentage of, lar of, of major expenditures spent on instruction, teaching classes and the like. The bottom line is called institutional support, which is federalese for sort of administrative overhead. And you can see that's trended upward about 1%. Now, you might say, well, 1% isn't very much. But if you're, let's say, the University of Texas Austin, and you have a $500 million a year budget, 1% of that is a pretty good hunk of money. So it makes a difference that in that bottom line, we're seeing more assistant deans and uh, directors and things of that sort. The top line, well, you know, instruction isn't quite the imperative that it used to be. Now, all of the things, and I could go on about factors, but all of these things have been among the major reasons why higher education enrollment in the United States has declined 10 years in a row. We have 2.8 or 2.9 million fewer students in higher education now than we had a decade ago. It's happened every year, and it was happening well before COVID. So COVID probably contributed to this, but it's certainly not the reason. That's a 15% decline. So now I show you this picture. That's a Studebaker, and that's a Zenith TV. And I'm showing you these because they don't exist anymore. They're out of business. But it hasn't happened in higher education for the most part, has it? In the regular economy, you lose money, you lose market share, you lose sales, you go out of business, not in higher education. And the reasons I just talked about, one through 10, are some of the reasons for that, that uh, higher education institutions have not gone out of business. They persist almost uh, without question. Only smaller private institutions located in rural areas, uh, for the most part, have uh, failed and gone under. Now, is Texas an exception? 
Well, sort of. You can see that uh, post-secondary enrollment, and that continue, <laughs> that, that includes not just four-year colleges and universities, but a lot of other institutions that are post-high school. It's gone down slightly, but now I want to dig into those numbers a little bit more. The bars are the same, but that red line is the enrollment of Texans in higher education per 1,000 Texans. Enrollment per capita, if you will. And you can see that's gone down about 10%. What that tells you is that many Texans aren't going on in higher education now that used to. Now, the reason Texans numbers haven't gone, Texas as a state hasn't gone down is the state's growing. But if you look at the percentage of Texans who are going on in higher education, that's gone down visibly. Who are the majority of individuals who aren't attending? And the answer is men. Guys like me, okay? Men aren't attending, and in particular, white men. I could put up a similar graph for black men. Black men's college attendance has fallen down so that now only about 35% of the student body at an HBCU is composed of men, 65% women. Black men are dropping out of higher education, but so are white men. This is one of the more puzzling things that one confronts today in terms of why this is so, and it's connected to labor force participation rates and lots of other things. But if you look at overall Texas post-secondary enrollment, while it was increasing 8%, white men went down 11%. So a real difference there in terms of what's going on. Now, I don't want to be Jeremiah here, but I think if we don't address some of the things that I've just put in front of you in terms of providing people with opportunities, we're courting problems in the United States of America. We are courting the kinds of things that result in robberies, people stacking businesses, there are all kinds of things that I could connect to this more or less vaguely, but uh, I think we are uh, courting problems that we do. Now, when I talk about opportunities, I want to emphasize, that at least to me, an opportunity is not a guarantee. An opportunity does not apply equality of outcomes, that everybody has to end up the same place. Rather, it's saying, I'm going to provide you with that ladder. I'm going to give you that ladder and make it financially possible for you to climb up on that ladder. I'm not going to guarantee you get up it. That's up to you. But I'm going to give you that. What are some things we need to do? Well, first of all, control college cost inflation. And this campus is, I think, a pretty good example of an institution that's done a pretty good job at controlling costs and providing mobility. More need-based financial aid. My bad example here is Georgia, the state. Georgia has the HOPE Scholarship Program, which is very popular, but it's all ability-based. And so almost 100% of all the financial aid the state of Georgia gives out is ability-based. Now, there's a spot for ability-based. We want to attract and retain people of talent. But none of it is going to need-based financial aid in Georgia. Well, it's had predictable effects there in terms of who can afford to go. I've already talked about reforming this federal student loan system. This fourth is important, and that's the major theme of that second book. College boards oftentimes have become unreasoning advocates for an institution. They think it's their job to support the administration, presidents such as I was, and to do more or less whatever the administration asks. Now, in Virginia, we have data going back about 10 years. Boards of visitors there, and that's what they're called, 
have voted 99% of the time unanimously in favor of tuition and fee increases. That suggests that the boards are not acting as fiduciaries. A fiduciary being somebody, of course, who has to take the best interests of clients into account. We need then, I think, governors who appoint members to boards who understand that they should be fiduciaries. Now, I'm a realist. I mean, I went through 15 years as a college president. I know how appoint board appointments are made, and I know what financial contributions make a difference and all this sort of stuff. But there are a few states that have nominating committees that present governors with slates of names, which they can ignore, and sometimes, of course, that's exactly what they do, but slates of names of people who would be good board members, who are talented and able to spend time. But in general, that's not the case right now. And with that, folks, I'm going to stop and I will respond to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Cook, definitely I'm going to buy your book. I got a grandson right now, it's, you know, going into college. And I'm worried that the money I left for my son, you know, in his, in his fund, now it's going to pass on to his grandson. So I want to assure you the money's well spent. Uh, but as someone who is a product from this university and someone who really did not use financial aid till the senior year in college, uh, I, used, I got a Pell Grant myself. I got a loan as my senior year. But do you have any data that indicates, uh, and, and the, way I, the way I went to college, I, I was working. I worked my way to college. That's the way I was brought up. Uh, I wasn't really thinking of getting financial aid to go to college. I was thinking of getting an education, and but working to get my education at the same time. And I think that's pretty common in this part of the world of Texas and South. You know, it's a hard work ethic of the Hispanic. Uh, and but is there any data out there where that shows that students? How many students that are on financial aid are also employed part-time or not? Yeah, there, there are data out there relative to how many students are employed. And for whatever it's worth, in my class, that's one of the questions I ask at the end of the term. How many hours are you working? And students who work more do better except when they work too much. So what we're talking about is having a job and working while you're in college seems to inculcate a certain discipline, a certain seriousness, uh, the notion that I'm part of this, I'm not simply getting money from my parents or wherever from the federal government, but you can do too much of that. And I have students who are working 30 and 40 hours. I mean, they have full-time jobs and they're doing my class and a bunch of other ones, and those students don't do as well. But, um, well, I, I can go back to my own personal circumstance. When I went to Illinois State University as a freshman, it was possible to work and pay your way through school. And so I merged with just a couple of hundred dollars of federal debt and that was it. But that's no longer possible for most students. Uh, it, the, the costs at a typical, even public four-year institution now are such that you are likely to emerge with significant debt. In fact, I showed you the averages in the $30,000 category. Not here at this institution, incidentally. It's lower because of cost containment and the like. But uh, a typical four-year institution, and many of those in Virginia, the students emerge with lots of debt and uh, that's, uh, that's a change. And I, I'm not, I mean, some of that is good, but uh, too much of it is not. Uh, thank you. You you're, uh, certainly uh, brought a lot of things uh, to the forefront, things that, that I honestly think about every day. Um, so, you know, cost containments, uh, certainly, certainly the state and the state's contribution, which has gone down as, as you know, in this in this state as well, but I, I think your 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 enrollment data is interesting. Um, I think that particularly your Texas data, because the ten percent decrease that you saw in the last two years, pretty much reflects or mirrors the percentage decrease that state of Texas saw in community college 
uh, reductions. Redu community college enrollment reduction was about 10% of the last of this last two years. Um, but I think part of the reason Texas has stayed up uh, is because we still have a young population. If you look at the at the Midwest and the Northeast um, and, and, and parts of the South now, the college age population is declining in some cases in the Northeast. It's, I mean, I was talking to a president in Maine several years ago who was worried because there are just no college age students in Maine. Uh, it's hard to find them. So I think that, you know, if you, if you look at the demographics nationwide, Texas is going to be ahead of the curve in terms of decreasing in the number of students because we have more, so we have more young people in the state. And, and then followed by California, which is now beginning to see the decline. But they're expect, not expecting us to see anything in major declines in until about 2030. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens um, because, of course, everybody's going to want students and Texas is going to become the hot spot for around the country, which is already, already is. I mean, I mean, there, there are more, let me say, there are more recruiters for Oklahoma in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area than there are for and all of the other institute, all of the institutions in Texas put together, um, just because they they want students. Yeah. So I just yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said. I'd, I'd add a couple of comments. Uh, one is that the community college decline in enrollment has been steep, and it's something we don't completely understand as to why that is so, uh, why students have decided not to go to community colleges, and uh, I'm sure there are going to be some good empirical studies done by economists and others that attack that, but it's not something right now that we really know why at the margin students who are interested in minimizing the cost of attendance and they're interested in some occupational specific things, why they're not attending community colleges. Uh, the Northern Snow Belt comment is really apropos because I grew up in Illinois. I graduated from Illinois State. Uh, its enrollment has remained roughly constant. Uh, University of Illinois has gone up a bit in Champaign-Urbana and University of Illinois Chicago has gone up a bit. All the rest of the directional institutions, Eastern Illinois, Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, et cetera, they've all gone down precipitously. So one of the things we see now is that students are opting oftentimes away from regional institutions unless the regional institution is cost competitive and unless the regional institution has specific programs that attract those. If it's just sort of an ordinary regional institution, they're losing students. Uh, students are uh, opting not to attend those and some of those are, like in Pennsylvania, become candidates for merger. They now have merged together campuses uh, in terms of programs and the like because they're just too small and too many of them. Other questions? Huh. Hey, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. A lot of thought-provoking information that you've uh, provided us with here today. I'm just wondering because as you see the data as you've presented it, and thank you, it was you know, very refreshing and eye-opening, you would think that all that money we spent on you know, student loans and, and throwing all that money at all these students was to provide greater opportunities for a broader class of people, and your data clearly suggests the opposite is going on. What do you think, having studied all the data, because we could spend you know, 10 days here just trying to figure out you know, how to delve into each one of the, the items you had there, but from your perspective, what can be done to actually contain the, you know, the runaway college costs? I mean, what, what do you see as steps that uh, as a country, you know, from a policy standpoint, you know, statewide, you know, in the federal wise, you know, what do universities have to do? I know you talked about universities having some accountability maybe for, hey, you know, if they're pushing student debt, you know, on, on their students, What's their you know, accountability to making sure that that gets paid off? Because we're looking at writing off $1.5 trillion of debt because these students can't pay it right now. Yeah. You know, and, and then you have declining you know, student population basis. So we didn't do what the policy or the politicians say we were doing. We're providing all these opportunities for all these kids to go off to university. Yeah. Well, uh, good comments. Uh, let's start with boards of trustees. 
no cost increase of any significance ever occurs without a board voting for it. So that's the place to start. And if we're talking about public institutions, we're talking about legislators who probably should include in appropriations bill incentives for cost control. If you do X, then you get Y. If you don't do X, then you don't get Y. Okay? Uh, I think those are the two major things that need to be done. Uh, but uh, this is a, uh, I'm not going to say it's insoluble, but I don't have a lot of confidence that those kinds of things are going to occur because politically they are non starters in lots of states. Uh, that's just not the way board members get appointed. That's not the way uh, universities behave, and legislators have other things on their minds other than putting themselves in a circumstance where they are penalizing institutions. There's a, been a bit of that in my home state of Virginia, uh, where uh, institutions that control costs get more money, and institutions that are serving more lower income students get more money and some things such as that. But if you're the University of Virginia, you don't care. That's too strong. They care. I mean, they, they'd rather have more money than less, but it doesn't make a major difference in their budget. So there are lots of institutions in the United States now that, uh, oh, lots, that's too strong. There are some institutions in the United States that, that are not quite, uh, insulated against the market, but almost. They just don't have to do some of these things. I mean, the University of Virginia, as an example, has an endowment of eight or nine billion dollars. If you think about spending 4% of that a year, 4% times nine billion dollars is what, uh, 360 million a year? Think what you could do in terms of increasing access and opportunity with 360 million dollars a year. I mean, they have an stu undergraduate student body that's only about 15 or 20,000. Old Dominion has more undergraduates than they do. But they just don't want to do that. Nobody's forcing them to do it, and it's not a profit-maximizing move. And so, basically, they, they do the talk, but they don't do the walk. Given that uh, <coughs> there is interest for generating more revenue for institution of higher education, and higher education happens to be one of the major exports of the United States, and foreign students will pay out-of-state tuition much higher than domestic, wouldn't you think that would be a good opportunity to issue more visas and have more foreign students to attend that would reduce the burden on federal or state budget? Yes, I, mean, I, I agree completely, and uh, historically the United States has been exporting higher education by bringing lots of students in internationally, and students are voting with their feet when they do that. Uh, it's unfortunate that our former president of the United States basically tried to choke that off, because if you look at the data, the international students coming into the United States do good things. They earn higher incomes than the typical American. They found firms. The firms grow more rapidly. You can go right down the line that this is good stuff. We ought to be admitting more of them and making it easier for them to come and then to stay. Now, as an economist, I'm a little bit in favor of cream skimming. Cream skimming meaning that we take a certain number of visas or entry permits and uh, give those out to people who come in with the demonstrated ability to do certain kinds of things in terms of investing in industry and doing things that produce jobs. I don't think all of our entries ought to be that way, but I think some of them ought to be because I think that's positively connected to economic growth. But international students, um, but, but there, there, there are things happening now that would make that tough to do. But, but uh, it's something that ought to be a goal to restore the position the United States had as the premier location internationally for international students. I'd like to return to that slide where you showed uh, the trends in male enrollment yeah. in higher education. Could you offer your perspective or your hypothesis on what's causing that? Apparently, it's, 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 it's both white and African-American. Yeah. 
I don't have a great explanation for this. This is a, one of these puzzles like with community colleges, but men appear to be more market oriented than women in the sense that they are more sensitive to labor market possibilities and outcomes. And therefore, when they look at college and say, if I major in communications at XYZ Tech, is that gonna lead to something? And the answer is maybe not. Uh, there is a data set out there that I would commend to you. Georgetown University has a center on the workforce and they have data there that show in great detail how much money students earn at specific colleges in specific majors. That's something to look at and one of the things that you see there is that the rate of return on an investment in a baccalaureate degree at many institutions in certain disciplines, let's call it basket weaving, just isn't very high, or it might even be negative. And so I think men maybe are a little bit more sensitive to those kinds of data than women. Uh, maybe not, but uh, that's a hypothesis I would throw out there. Uh, but men not attending college, we could put that right along with declining labor force participation rates for men. That's been going on for 20 years at least. Men are dropping out of the labor force, and you know we see low rates of unemployment now, but understand that the, you're not considered to be unemployed if you're not looking for a job. So these low unemployment rates reflect at least partially the fact that there are lots of people out there who aren't looking for a job, and hence they're not unemployed. Well, for men, that's become an endemic problem. And somehow now it is possible, I, I as an economist, to theorize, that you can cobble together some combination of benefits, of support from the family, from a church, maybe you commit a few crimes on the sign, who knows what the combination is, but it is possible to survive at a level that is sufficient to cause people to say, I don't need to do that. And so some of the job quitting rates that we've seen reflect, of course, you're not paying me enough and this isn't a very nice job and the like, but there were times, of course, when men in particular would take those jobs anyway, but they're not doing that now. And that's one of these sociological phenomena that uh, economists uh, haven't yet really been able to explain as well as we would like. As a follow-up question real quick, if I can, doctor, and, and, and given your economic background, how is it that you know, the demand for higher education is going down by your graph clearly, and the price continues to skyrocket, which is uh, you know, quite frankly something that you don't see in economics, right? I mean, you had the pictures up there. The Studebakers yes. and the Zeniths are out, right? I mean, the demand for that stuff went down and eventually they were gone. When do you see this going away then, or when do you see it actually impact? And is it when the government stops throwing money and you know, student debt so people can just borrow and borrow and borrow, or what is it? Well, 75% of the students in higher education are in the public sector. It is very difficult to name any public sector institution, especially colleges and universities, that's ever gone out of business. It just doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because they have political support, they have a circumstance where the local legislators will raise holy hell if you start talking about narrowing down or merging or eliminating. So in the public sector, this is largely a political matter and it relates to why there are relatively few governmental programs that ever go out of existence. Forget about higher education. Uh, that's just sort of the nature of the political mechanism. Uh, in the private sector, we've seen some institutions go out of business. I think we will see more of that in the next decade because we are not in Texas, but nationally, we're facing a demographic decline. If you look at the number of high school graduates beginning at the end of this decade, nationally, the number of high school graduates begins to decline nationally, and in some states, it's going down precipitously. So at that point, I think we will see, especially in the private sector, institutions going out of business, where they simply, there, there simply won't be bodies around to, to, uh, for them to enroll. Uh, so, uh, 
again, this is one of these things where there are lots of different factors, but uh, in the public sector, I think the major thing is public sector institutions just never go out of business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this informative. We did have something positive to tell us here. Your, your data on TAMIU, uh, we appreciate it. Yes. Uh, we do have a gift to you, a token of our appreciation. Uh, we thought about giving you a check, but given the rate of inflation, we figured as an economist you would spend it immediately. Hopefully, this will. Can I sell you. this? Huh? <laughs> we would hope not. <laughs> but I, we hope that you display this in a prominent position to show your appreciation of this gift. But thank you for coming today and sharing with us your wisdom. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Can you send that to me? Huh? Can you send that to me? We can. Yeah, yeah, because it won't fit in my suitcase. Uh, we're a little early because I don't think the next session starts till around two. So you can uh, play with your cell phones, I guess, for a while. Okay. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful day.